I like what God's doing. You know, I woke up this morning with God. He said that I'm on the move and I haven't stopped. And not to get distracted by other people's personal um, anointings, agendas, or perspectives, but to realize that God is on the move doing something. He's already talking to us about the word of the year for 25. And it's not that we're done in 24, but, um, I just love the way that he prepares us so well around here. And I don't even think, you know, sometimes when you're saturated in goodness, you don't really understand how prepared you are. And I think that, you know, he's really raising up, um, some maturity for us for this next season. I like maturity, don't you? So that means I got scraped on a lot. I like to scrape on you a little bit. Let's get close enough so I can. I want to do a little bit of part two on the masterpiece of love tonight. I, um, I like love. I like real authentic love. I like to, um, I, I wanted to share with you just a little encounter I had with him many years ago. Um, Because I was um, raised in, I would just say, a uh, ultra-anointed house, there was everything wasn't good in it, but that really wasn't the point. The point was, you know, I remember my dad would, he would, when we would go to church, he would remind me of an Old Testament where the Spirit of God would fall on him. And he could have been yelling and screaming at my mom on the way to church. My my dad was notorious for, he would get ready because he was an early bird. And like he got up at four o'clock, I think, every day of my life that that I knew him until, you know, he was older. But and he would, on Sunday mornings, he would go and he would get in the car and he would honk at my mom until she got us all ready to come get in the car. And man, that bugged me for a long time. But I loved his zeal to go to church. We, he, When he died, I did his memorial service. And I had, my dad was um, emotionally abusive to my mom most of her life and they were married for 67 years and that's a long time but I'm not even for sure that she would phrase it that way that's my vernacular but when I stood up to give his memorial service I had asked the Lord you know I had forgiven him when I was 18 and I walked in forgiveness for him my entire life but when I stood up to give his memorial service, you know, I wanted to be really authentic because I'm really not like a liar, you know, I'm kind of a truth teller. And so the one word that God gave me for him was faithful. And I, he was faithful to the house of God. He would always go. And so I remember when, um, Later on in life, I started wanting to know more about authentic love. I think that I I waited till I uh, I was a virgin when I got married, and I got married at 28, and I waited. I wanted to go into that relationship with a pure heart, and and so I was naive to the fact that um, everyone's not like me, you know, and so. In my marriage, I it, I was deflicted, as Cece would say. It's it's a di- com- I'm in conflict, and deficiency is deflicted. And I realized that that set me on a course to discover what real love was, because I thought it was going to be marriage, and then I discovered it wasn't. And all the marriage say, okay, no, don't, don't. And so. I began to just read the word and I began to read that God is love. And so I knew that there was a foundation that he was something that was the standard, if you will. He's, he's the one that decides what love is. 
we're not the deciders of that. And I began to read uh, 1 Corinthians 13, and I remember where I was and where I was sitting when he said to me, Teresa, I'm going to ask you, when you die, did you learn to love? And this is what love is. And I be, when, when I heard those words and I began to read 1 Corinthians 13, I'm not going to read it to you tonight, but it's the chapter it says, you know, all the things that love is. And he told me after I got through, he said, it's not just one of those things. Real love is all of those things operating at the same time. And that felt hard because <laughs> I've been patient and I've been kind. But am I patient and kind all the time? And so, you know, I began to really seek him on how I could live that out because I, I feel like what's in the word is possible. Do, and so if he's the perfect standard, I just have to get used to this thing called I'm adjusting. Please don't get rigid and act like you don't have something you need to adjust. And if you want to move fast, if you want to be on the fast track like Jared, then you got to get up against some scraping from some old crusty women <laughs> that have been around the mountain a few times and know how to mature quickly. You know, you're on a team. If we ever thought that way, that when you come into the room, you are in one boat together. I don't know if you can tell, but we've had a little shift in the last couple of weeks. I don't know if you can hear it in the worship. You know, they're not up here to perform. They're up here to lead you to find your worship. They're not up here to display something for a bunch of spectators. They're here to pull out of your innermost being a river that's looking to flow. And I don't know if you can tell, but we've, we've stepped into a little, anybody been feeling it? And, and it's, it's, isn't it tangible? I mean, it's, how many have been here more than 10 years? It's tangible, isn't it, for all you old people? We've been here a while. We, we know what it was like when there were 10 people and then 17 people and then 27 people and then 21 people. And then we, you know, we had that time where, you know, all eight people left at one time. And then because why we're, we're not trying to produce performance. If I could just help you understand that, that, that this, masterpiece of love that he's talking about is it actually rids you of performance. It actually uh, causes you to not try to fix something from your past on your own, but actually go through something where that it actually washes you thoroughly. It, it, it has a, a sozo has the ability to completely transform one event in a moment's notice. And so with those transpiring events, then, then my heart becomes open to love like him. And see, you know, the, the first thing about God that you have to understand is that he demonstrated when he said, let there be, he demonstrated the art of boundary making. That he had to demonstrate that because his love creates the necessary boundaries for something to grow. That's why sometimes, not really a plan of mine or anything, but sometimes when people come, I've heard it said all hell breaks loose, but hell was already loose. <laughs> we had just become friends with it. And so when come, somebody comes and says, you, you're not meant to, to be suicidal. I mean, I'm not going to have you raise your hands, but 
I would venture to say most all of y'all in here before you came to One Life, not all of you, but most of you, were suicidal before you came here at one point in your life. And so what the enemy couldn't destroy in you, think about it for a minute. A room full of people where a bunch of y'all didn't want to live to the point where you, you're you dying to live. You know, that spirit of suicide, it, it always comes by right before the breakthrough. Without fail. You know, I used to... There used to be, back in the 1800s, we had a um, a group that did suicide hotline, and I worked for the man that started it. And, you know, it was another weird gig at this corporate, at Kerr McGee, where I worked downtown, is that Mr. McGee let my boss start that on his own time at work. I mean, on company time at work. Because he so believed in what my boss was. And people would call, you know, and and I it it birthed in me that I another it's another marking moment as I talked about a while back, that I I, I need an answer. If so many people are tormented with the spirit of suicide, we've got to find an answer. And you know, it's it's easy to say, oh, love, love's the answer. But see, I I have to demonstrate what love would do in the midst of torment. Otherwise, I'm I'm just a spectator and hoping God shows up. I hope if I can't do anything but try to present to you that you're not meant to be a spectator in your life. The things that Jesus said is, is supposed to challenge us to say, am I really doing what the Father is doing? Do I e- am I even aware? Am I even asking? Is it preeminent on my mind that am I doing today what the Father is doing? Do I know that that exists in my life? And am I measuring myself at the end of the day? Am I okay enough and secure enough that at the end of the day I lay in bed and I say, did I really do? I ask myself that question every day. Today, did I really do what I saw the Father doing? Or was I checked out, blocked out? Because I want to measure myself. And I, and I know I'm not super good at it. I know some of y'all criticize me and you don't think I'm good at it. And people tell me all the time I'm not friendly enough and I don't have enough time for everybody but at the end of the day, I, I really want to say and ask him, did I do what I saw the Father doing? In most days, I hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And see, it, it ruined me for rescuing. Can I just, can I, can I? Rescuing is the counterfeit for healing. You know, you can talk to Breezy. I mean, she used to let everything in the world come over. And Charlie let them come over. That's how they had it. But see, now they see their anointing differently. And so I can let one little rescuee come over and mess up my whole life and my whole finances. Or I can partner together with the Father. Because see... When I partner with the Father, there's just going to be some needs that don't get met by me. Listen, there's nothing harder. You know, when I hear things that I was like, oh, I wish I had been there because if I had been there, I would have said blank. If I was just there, if I had just been there, I would have, I would have walked them down this other road. But see, that's not, we can't live there. We just, we have to live as this masterpiece of his that he's 
he is infusing me and he's painting on me and he's delivering to me the information I need for my next step. And see, that's, that's really what we're doing over here. You know, just to reiterate it in, in Ephesians, it's we're God's masterpiece. Listen, I don't know if I can help you, but you're not trying to create a masterpiece. You're it. Stop trying to create this beautiful masterpiece of your life and look around at that you're it already. I can either try to spend my life fixing me till I feel good about what I deliver, or I can just deliver it in the color scheme I'm in today. You know, Pam and I went to give this bid the other day, and this guy was wanting us to paint his house, and it was a a really large house, so we were trying to decide if we wanted to do it or not. (laughs) Give us the easy jobs. And it was really ugly. And... I was trying to talk, I I said to him, well, because he was complaining about his previous bid. And I said, well, if you would do this and this and this, then it would be cheaper. And you would have thought I said, if you cut off all your arms and limbs, it'll be cheaper. (laughs) He said, no way. That would run the Oh, architectural design. And in that moment, I realized he was an owner of his own masterpiece. I'm glad I'm smart because I was like, oh, right. And I was like, later on, I got it in there. Did you design this house? I sure did. I knew what was going on then. And so I began to tell him how masterful it was. I began to brag on him about, wow, how intricate. So what did that do? He, it opened up the door for him to tell me every detail. And these windows here are from London. And these over here are from Bangladesh. And these over here are from there. And this is over there from this. And this is over there. The thing that I thought was ugly. Was his masterpiece. You know, in that moment, I thought about this message, and I thought, I'm glad I can see it. I'm glad I didn't force my opinion in there, because I have one. I'm glad I could see what he saw. And see, it's just like I said last week, everybody's not going to think you're a masterpiece. But somebody somewhere is waiting for you. To show up on the scene and demonstrate this right here. That you're his masterpiece. You're created brand new in Jesus. So you can do the good things he planned for you. The only way you're going to do the good things that God pre-planned is when you see yourself as his masterpiece. Don't let what someone said when you were five. Don't let those vehicles that got you here shape the opinion of God over your life. You may have to... You know, I was talking to the homeschool kids, and, you know, we're talking about that the saints do the crushing. And I was telling them, you're a crusher. What are we crushing? We're crushing all the things of the enemy that have kept us from seeing that we're the masterpiece. What if we had an entire room of people that said, I'm God's masterpiece. And I may not be pretty to you. But I'm going to meet somebody tomorrow. That God... Prearranged. It says right here he prearranged it. He prearranged, prearranged 
See, that's that's the guarantee you can't miss it. And so don't go acting like a jerk that doesn't know they're a masterpiece. Don't share your opinion with someone because you might hurt their feelings. Be Learn to be diplomatic in whatever situation you're in because you never know when the door's going to swing wide open and they're going to look at you and they're going to go, what do you have for me? You know, think about it. These pictures are not hanging up there. They're not saying, do you like me? They're not asking you, do you think I'm pretty? Do you like how I look? It was in the heart of the painter. If I could ever get these art students to understand this one thing. In the heart of the student is a masterpiece waiting for someone that's not them. See, when I deliver the heart of God, I don't pick the audience. And see, we have been so shaped by the opinions of other people that we have to spend so much time getting revalidated. I mean, when I tell you that I literally had one person come and stick their finger on my forehead at Bethel and say, I, God says, I validate you. I'm telling you, he's the only man that has ever done that. If I had been needing 10, I wouldn't have gotten it. You wouldn't be sitting here today. Y'all wouldn't have the freedom that you experienced coming into his presence in this place if I needed 10 validations because I didn't. In John 17, Jesus said this, John 17, 10, For all who belong to me now belong to you. And all who belong to you now belong to me as well. I like that. But look at this. My glory is revealed through their surrendered lives. That's the heart of Jesus right there. The heart of Jesus that knew the heart of God that knows the heart of you. And he says, come. Come as living stones. Come experience rejection, just like I did. Ask him. Say, let me see rejection as confirmation. Let me see rejection as confirmation. Let it shape me. Let it make the audience that I'm going to display in front of bigger. Because I'm not asking for their opinion. I'm displaying the heart of what he made me to be. And so he says that the glory of God is looking to be revealed. And what did he choose he chose someone who says, I surrender all. Not one time. Have you ever just been right there in tension and you knew, you knew you had a way you wanted to do something? I have it all the time. I, I get up here and I'm thinking, oh, I just wish I, I had all those notes ready because that's just my favorite thing and I want it color coded and charted and I want it to have little arrows and little peace signs and pictures and all kinds of stuff. And I get up here with one verse, half of a verse maybe. You know, I'm standing there while they're worshiping and, and he dropped that verse into my heart. I, 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 don't, I couldn't hear very good, but it's Psalm 17, 15. It says, as for me, I shall see your face in righteousness. And I will be fully satisfied when I awake to find myself seeing you in my likeness. They just sang that. I sent them that verse, and they sang that out of that verse. Why? 
because he's trying to awaken us. See, whenever you see him, you should see you. It's, it's such an intermingled mass of goodness where he's in you because you invited him in. He knocked. And you're so not good at being a son because you were just an orphan two minutes before. And he says, come and experience all the wealth that I have. And he knew we'd be wasteful. He knew just accepting him would not make us instantaneously mature. And we would stumble our way awkwardly. Trying to do different with everything that's still around me. I've, I've got all this stuff around me and all these choices around me that I had before. And now I know Jesus. And now he's like saying, you're just like me. And I'm like, I don't feel anything like you. But he says, come like a living stone. That song we just wrote, come and see what I'm doing. He's on the move. And he invited you to come along. So quit acting like you have to be your own nature. See, see, the goal of this new life is to stand before the same obstacles and just say, what do you want me to do? Yesterday, I chose all on my own. I didn't ask anybody. Can you not feel it? Can you not feel that tension where really, do you just want to spend your whole life someone helping you clean up all the messes? Or do you really want to just learn to ask? I had two people this morning text me before 8 o'clock and they had limiting mindsets and they were trying to describe the choice they were going to make out of this tiny little mindset. And I said, do you see how limiting that is? Of course they didn't. They had thought about it, prayed about it, they have, are presenting to me their findings. And all I can say is, that's super limiting. Go back. After I untether your limited mindset, and let's ask with a non-limiting mindset. Wow, the, the options are so much bigger. That's what, that's what he's, he's trying to... Look at this. It says, Colossians 2, 3 says, Our spiritual wealth is in him, just like a hidden treasure waiting to be discovered. Listen, God's ways are waiting to be discovered. Who's interested? That means it probably just didn't lay in all right out there in the open. You know, somebody else called today and they had a limiting mindset. Didn't they, Lynn? And Lynn was telling me these two choices. And I said, well, choice one. I just, you know, this is how we have it. Lynn and I have it this way, okay. Choice one just looks dumb. Who would do that? And she's like, well, that was the one I was thinking. I was like, yeah, that's just dumb. And, she said, and this, I love Lynn. Help me see. I was like, come. Come sit at the t wisdom of table, because the wisdom of table. Because <laughs> you can't see. And I begin, the table began to unfold like wisdom. And, I, and when we were through, she's like, oh, Yeah. And she even said, I don't know why I couldn't see that. I said, because you needed to come to the table of wisdom. It's not, it's not a diss on your intelligence. 
It's a question of connection. You know, it's really hard to work with 10% of the story. You know, when you give me 10% of the story, I have to try to figure out in the spirit. Well, just say the story. So much faster. He says, for our spiritual wealth is in him. Like hidden treasure waiting to be discovered, heaven's wisdom and endless riches of revelation knowledge. If I said today you could have $1,000 or you could have heaven's wisdom. Now don't, I know. But right there in that moment tells you where you're at. Do I want the 1000 which what will do? It's a temporary reprieve for a concern I have. Or do I want a wealth mindset that teaches me how Together, that's just different. Romans 11 says this, actually God considers all of humanity to be prisoners of their unbelief. Ha! Do you not love that scripture more than anything? <laughs> Romans 11, 32, actually God considers all of humanity to be prisoners of their unbelief. Thank you, God. So your unbelief's not special. It's just limiting. Who does it actually limit? Him. It actually limits him. Because, see, he's limitless. And so if I'm a prisoner, I'm in torment. Even if you're freer, sorry, even if you're freer than you used to be, that's why I won't let you say I'm better than I used to be. That means nothing around here. Even if I'm freer, I'm still in prison. Every place that he's trying to build up my faith, my little, it doesn't even take that much. It doesn't even take that much. It just has to be pointed at the right direction with the right God. There's other gods, right? So he says, all, God considers all humanity to be prisoners of their unbelief so that he can unlock our hearts and show his tender mercies into mercy where we just to all who come to him it's not hard come i said to the men sunday come did you come Whenever we come, it gives him opportunity to show us where we have unbelief. Because you weren't designed for unbelief. You're actually equipped with faith. He deposited in everyone the seed of faith. So I already have faith. I have to do so much to squash it. See, how it gets squashed is I pray for things that are not his will. Listen, I, I, trust me, as you grow in the awareness that you have faith, oh, how can I say this quick? In the awareness that your faith is meant to do something with God every day. I'll say it like that. That's fast. Then he begins to open up other opportunities, things that now I'm just like, oh, God, I, I really wish this would happen. And I really hope that you will. But I, I believe it is, and I'm praying that this will occur. 
it's like, bam, I wake up the next morning and that very thing just happened. Or, or I'll just go to bed and I'll be praying for somebody. You know, somebody in here had a big breakthrough last week, but what he didn't know is that God had me up the whole night before interceding for him. See, his breaking point was the lowest point. Been there? Anybody been there? And see, what happened was then unbelief got exposed. The torment of the enemy was a light got shone on it. And it was revealed what it really was. And so what happened? The faith was already there. I love this next verse. It says in 33, CT, you're coming because you got your laptop out. Who could ever wrap their minds around the riches of God or the depth of his wisdom or the marvel of his perfect knowledge? And who could ever explain the wonder of his decisions? Or search out the mysterious ways he carries out his plans. For who has discovered how the Lord thinks or is wise enough to be the one to advise his plans? Who has ever first given something to God that obligates God to owe him something in return? For out of him is the sustainer of everything. Came everything. And now everything finds its fulfillment in him. Think of that. That's what your masterpiece carries. There is not, listen to me, there is nothing you're going to face tonight or tomorrow that he has not already prepared you for. If you step toward it and you ask, help me see this. When I'm standing there with that man and I'm trying to save him money and I realize, no, he needs someone to celebrate his masterpiece, I had a choice. I could go with my own opinion. And again, I have one. You do too. There's nothing you face. Listen, there's nothing you come up against you don't first have an opinion. You have got to learn to override that. You've got to learn to override it. Just jump right over that, right over here in front of God. Stand right here before him and say, how do you see that? To the degree that you can do that process fast, you will begin to see the greater things done through your life. To the degree it says that you're, you're, you're halted between two opinions right here. And see, my awareness that he's speaking in every situation, I just may not be able to hear him well because my opinion may be, my way may be so strong. When my way is so strong, it'll crash and burn. Thank you, God. And I'll either, I'll either be bitter because I didn't get my way. It will change me to ask. And see, every masterpiece knows who made them. And they want to they wanna operate from the master's design, not from how they feel. Come on, Cece. Thank you, Tisa. What a beautiful message. So, so beautiful. Talk about an expression of the Father's heart. Whew, I love our messages around here that are, you know, they're fully spiritual, but they're also fully practical. And, oh, wow, they just really demonstrate um, really, you know, the Father coming and doing this with us, and doing this journey with us and the process with us. I love that over and over again, the Word tells us and gives us examples of how 
God didn't just set this whole crazy thing in motion and then sit back and watch it like an ant farm or something, you know. It kind of used to be my theology. <laughs> That's what I thought, you know. It really was. Honestly, I didn't know much about God before before I came to know Jesus. So I was like, I guess we're like an ant farm just being, you know, this is entertaining or something. Not at all like that, you know, <laughs> not at all like that. I love that it says that, you know, Jesus is in heaven interceding for us, that the Holy Spirit is praying for us. The Holy Spirit is searching the heart of the Father all the time for the things we don't know, that we don't remember, that the Holy Spirit will remind us of the things Jesus taught us. I mean, he expresses over and over again the way he will do this with us, you know, and each of these steps. And that's the beautiful thing that no matter how much of a of a challenge or um a drive or a fire that these messages light up in us, we always can trust to know that the Holy Spirit and Jesus and Papa God himself are right there with us, ready to take the next step with us and walk it out with us. Um, I wanted to read the scripture again and then share just a little thing I saw during worship and ask you to participate with me, a little quick prophetic act, okay? So um, I think Tisa read this whole verse. I'm not sure, but Colossians 2, I am contending for you. Just hear Jesus even saying this. This was Paul speaking, but this is Jesus also, okay? This is Jesus's heart right here, the Father's heart. I am contending for you that your hearts will be wrapped in the comfort of heaven and woven together into love's fabric. This will give you access to all the riches of God as you experience the revelation of God's great mystery. Christ himself. For our spiritual wealth is in him like hidden treasure waiting to be discovered, heaven's wisdom and endless riches of revelation knowledge. You know, the one of the things that occurred to me tonight is I've been thinking about Jesus being our redeemer today. And so he redeems us from all the stuff that got in the way of us experiencing this and advancing in that in heaven's wisdom and in this these endless riches of who Christ is in us. And then he also um, he also has gone ahead of us and made a way for us and pre-deposited us with everything that we need. And he also says that the kingdom of God is in us and it's always advancing and it will never stop advancing. So if you really put that together, it basically says every single day of my life that I yield to him, that I listen to him, that I seek him out, I get something new. I get something new unveiled to me. I get a new part of my inheritance in him just because it's another day and because he loves me so much and he is constantly working towards my redemption and the redemption of everything that he pre-deposited in us. And so tonight, um, or when we were in worship, I can't remember if somebody had already mentioned washing or not, honestly, but I was seeing a picture of, um, that he was washing our feet tonight, that Jesus was washing our feet. And that story in scripture had took on more meaning for me a couple of years ago when he gave me this word about our inheritance. And the, we had a whole word and a song, I think we wrote about our new inheritance. That's been coming back around to me a lot because I really truly believe that we are stepping into a new inheritance in this season. And But in reality, we're step, we have that available every single day. But it's a real emphasis, I can tell, in this season about stepping into a new inheritance. And so I'm going to go and read just a little bit from that story. It's in John 13, where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And I saw something a little bit new to me in verse 3. John 13, verse 3, in the Passion Translation. Of course, this is the night before. You know, It was Jesus' last night on earth, and he's at the feast with all of the um, his disciples, and he knows he's going to the cross soon. And verse three says, now Jesus was fully aware that the father had placed all things under his control for he had come from God and was about to go back to be with him. I think the about to go back to be with him was what stood out to me predominantly before. But tonight it's the fact that he was fully aware that the father had placed all things under his control. That's really the first part of that sentence, that Jesus was fully aware that the Father had placed all things under his control. And that is what part of our new inheritance is us becoming more fully aware. You know, that's what Jesus wants to do is help us to become more fully aware of what our inheritance in him is. We're stepping every day into a greater awareness of what he's already given us in himself. 
And so he says, so he got up from the meal and took off his outer robe, took a towel and wrapped it around his waist, poured water into a a basin and began to wash the disciples' dirty feet and dry them with his towel. And of course, if you know the story, Jesus goes on and he gets to Simon Peter and Simon Peter thinks, no, this is out of order. You can't wash my feet. I should be washing your feet. You know, don't even look at my dirty feet. You know, like this is wrong. This is wrong. And so he freaks out and Jesus says, you don't understand yet the meaning of what I'm doing, but soon it will be clear to you. Now, the Passion Translation gives an incredible footnote there, and it says, by removing their sandals and washing their feet, Jesus was showing them that he was granting them a new inheritance, his own. Now, there's a reference there that the sandals were used back in that time as a way of making a contract. And there's a reference even if you look in Ruth um, 4, that it's mentioned again, and it says that the sandal symbolized the man's property right. So to give up the sandal meant he would no longer walk on that property and claim it as his. He had transferred the rights to another. So Jesus came to wash our feet tonight. And I just want to ask you before we go, if you would participate with me and take off your sandals, take off our shoes. Let's just take our shoes off as a sign, as a prophetic sign that we have transferred our rights to him. And we don't we no longer want to walk in the ways that we had before. We want that washing that he came to do tonight. He want we want that defilement. It said that Jesus was in the other footnote, it said that that every defilement would be removed so they could place the sole of their feet upon the new covenant inheritance. That's what Jesus was doing when he was washing their feet. And so when I saw Jesus washing our feet tonight, he was coming to say, I've got a new thing for you. I've got a new territory for you. If you'll partner with me and you'll just take off what you owned before, what you said was yours, was your right to walk in. Your, your justice, your reason for being bitter, your reason, reason for being hopeless, your reason for being angry, your reason for holding on to injury or depression or hopelessness, whatever your reason was, if you will take that off tonight, then he's washing it off tonight. He's washing that off so you can receive the new thing, that new inheritance of himself in you. So Jesus, we just say tonight, We know you're here. We thank you for coming and bringing your presence. And thank you that every time you come, you wash us with your presence. You wash us with your love. You wash us and you unveil even more of our, of these hidden treasures, these spiritual treasures of who we actually have living inside of us, of the one who laid down his life so that we could experience him. We could experience you. We have you living inside of us. And Jesus, yet we are we struggle at times because of the, the things that have stuck to our feet, the, the, the places that have worn sores and, and become raw and painful and we've had reactions to and we've built philosophies around and theologies around and operating systems around. And tonight we just say we don't want them anymore. And so we just say we choose with our will tonight to lay them aside. And so we break off our partnership with them. We break our right to walk the way we did when we walked into this room today, the way we were just a few hours ago. Even we lay it down and we say, we don't have that right anymore. We give those to you because we want to receive your inheritance tonight. We want to receive the cleansing that you came to do tonight so that the soles of our feet could walk in the brand new inheritance that you have today. The kingdom of God is advancing today. And you said it was advancing in us. That means there's a new way for me to walk today. There's a new inheritance for me to see, for me to walk in, for me to know and operate out of a new way of understanding that we are your masterpieces of love. And we want to operate and live and function fully out of who you made us to be, not what harm in our past and people who didn't know us well or didn't know you said or molded or or put on us so jesus we just thank you for coming to wash wash our feet tonight thank you for saying over and over again that that your inheritance is our inheritance that you were the first to be called son so but the first of many that would be called sons and daughters 
You were the first of many to be called sons and daughters. And so we just step today with, with these, our cleansed feet into the new inheritance and we will, we will delight in who you are and we will look around with brightness in our eyes and, and, and an, and an eagerness to discover the newness that you, that we're stepping into tonight. So I thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. I thank you for your washing. I thank you for your tenderness and your devotion and your faithfulness to us. Your devotion and your faithfulness exceeds anything we have ever seen demonstrated in our lives. But I thank you that you come and you show us over and over and over again how fully devoted you are to us, walking as restored children of God, as sons and daughters, as kings and queens of your kingdom on earth. So we thank you tonight, Papa. And we just say we love you, Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And it's in your mighty, mighty name that we pray. Cheryl, do you want to come and take up offering? So powerful. I love what CC was saying there at the end that we give over his rights to him. And I think the painting masterpiece analogy is such a good one. You know, when we look at these paintings on the wall, that painting didn't decide a single thing about itself. It didn't decide the size. It didn't decide the value. It didn't decide what or how was going to be painted on it. The creator of it did. And I think about the beauty of that. It just yielded to its design, created a fullness of a display. And I see that in our offering. I see that in the way that we give. When we don't limit the way that God wants to work through us, we have this amazing multifaceted display where we can show what God is like in all different kinds of ways. And so giving is just a really, really fun way. I see myself as like a secret undercover agent when I give, you know, because I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. And no, but you guys don't know what's going to happen with my with my giving, but it ends up doing stuff. It's really cool. So. Um, so let yourself be on full display. Um, yield to all the ways that he is speaking to you. Um, giving and your tithe and offering is a really, really practical way to open up new layers of just the beauty of your life. So we've got a couple ways you can give. We've got the box back there. If you have cash or checks, put it in an envelope. Notate on the envelope how you're giving. We've got the QR code on the screens and the website listed out so you can give electronically. Drop down on that indicates how you're giving. We always got it posted up in the back. We always have it on Evernote. If you don't have Evernote, you should get Evernote and sign up for it. And it's on our website too. You can give on our website. Just can't indicate how you're going to give. So let's stand and do our tide declaration. Papa God, thank you for being my provider. Thank you for being my sustainer. I lack nothing while I live under the canopy of El Shaddai. I bring my tithe freely today. I bring my offering freely today. I bring them both with joy because you said you love a cheerful giver. I delight in giving as you delight in giving to me. I give these offerings to you. I give these offerings to demonstrate my love for how well you care for me. I yield my life to your direction, instruction, and function. I yield today to bring about your yield in my life. Thank you for caring for me. Freely I have received. Freely I give today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Jesus, I just thank you for all the ways we are the living display, your masterpiece of love. I just bless our tithe and offering in Jesus' name. Amen.